Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for a virtual tour of Vulcan Park and Museum. I'm Casey and I work in the education department here. I'm so excited to have you and I hope that you enjoy this introduction to our museum which focuses on the history of the city of Birmingham and of course Vulcan himself. Today we will be learning about the suffrage movement here in Birmingham. If you have any questions, please comment below and be sure to follow us on social media for updates and info about our next episode. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today for an exploration of voting rights in Alabama as, uh, as pertains to women. 2020 marks 100 years since the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which is the amendment that gave women the right to vote. So what we'll talk about today is how that amendment passed to give some women the right to vote, and in southern states like Alabama, it didn't give all women the right to vote, and how people have worked over the course of many, many years to secure the voting rights that we can use and enjoy today. Our story today starts with a period called Reconstruction, which is the time right after the Civil War, when the federal government was putting in place a lot of laws that were meant to provide equal rights to all citizens. During this time of Reconstruction, laws were passed that made black people officially citizens, that extended the vote to black men, but not necessarily to black women. And then southern governments like that in Alabama fought against those reforms and tried to push them back. So. During the 1870s, there were black people serving in the state senate and the state legislature in Alabama. And the white lawmakers who had traditionally held power were really trying to, to um, get those reforms overturned. So in 1901, the political party that was in power in Alabama uh, called for a new constitutional convention. So they all met to pass a new constitution for the state and their goal, as they stated, was basically to make white supremacy the law of the land. Here at this Constitutional Convention, you see some of your earliest suffragists start to really appeal that women should have voting rights and then other groups also appealed for voting rights for black people in Alabama too. So the Constitutional Convention heard some of these complaints. They were, they were addresses to the convention or they were letters or they were petitions, but in the end they ended up passing a law that disenfranchised more people than it enfranchised. And disenfranchised just means it, it took away their right to vote or did not extend to them the right to vote. The first women's suffrage groups in Alabama formed in the late 1890s, and they formed in places like Decatur, Huntsville, uh, Verbena, Tuskegee. One of the women, uh, Frances Griffin, who argued before the Constitutional Convention that women should have the right to vote, was a founder of the Verbena Suffrage Group. So these groups at this point in Alabama history they distributed literature and they did talks, but they weren't particularly active because the environment was so hostile to the idea of women voting. Because to everyday Alabamians, women voting represented a change to what they were used to, to gender and social roles, and to how they thought society would be and how their families would be. So they thought it would affect their personal lives in a negative way. While white women were working on these women's suffrage activities, a lot of black women were really left out of this movement. That happens because of the South was segregated and the 1901 Constitution really made a lot of that segregation more stark in the years since it passed. One way black women did try to improve their communities and their lives was by organizing women's clubs. These clubs had a lot of different goals. They focused on education, they focused on improving economic opportunities for people in their communities. They focused on helping to raise stronger, better families. The most famous black women's club was the Tuskegee Women's Club that was founded in 1895 by Margaret Murray Washington, who was the wife of Tuskegee Institute's Booker T. Washington. They, um, that club was founded of, of the wives of educators and of women who are educators themselves. The Tuskegee Women's Club wasn't a suffragist movement necessarily, but they, they took suffrage action and tried to expand political rights for themselves as part of their broader work in the community. Another prominent suffragist from the Tuskegee Women's Club was Adela Hunt Logan, who was very active for the cause of women's suffrage and wrote extensively about it and about how voting rights should be extended to everybody, to black people and to women. So around 1910, a new generation of suffragists took up the cause and they um, were a lot more active. They were building on momentum nationally because a lot of other states were starting to, to give women voting rights. 
and the, um, there was talk of national amendments. So these women were really doing a lot more. They were a lot more active in lobbying the legislature. They gave talks. They did a whole tour of the state. They got petitions signed to take to the state legislature because they wanted a referendum. They wanted the state legislature of Alabama to put the issue to the voters. That initiative eventually failed. The legislature did not pass the referendum. And so one of our more prominent suffragists here in Birmingham Patty Ruffner Jacobs, she set her sights on the federal amendment because she realized that that was the only way women in Alabama were going to see change. 1920 was the year the federal amendment passed that gave women the right to vote. The vote came up for the Alabama state legislature to vote on it. They voted not to accept the amendment and they made a separate vote to actually reject the amendment. So the, the amendment finally became law with its ratification in Tennessee. That was the 36th state to ratify the amendment. The voting rights that were extended through federal amendment in 1920 in Alabama really only applied to white women because of all of the provisions that the 1901 Constitution put in place to keep black men from voting. Things like literacy tests, poll taxes, um, intimidation and terror all could be applied to keep black women from voting. Although white women who were educated could vote, and white women who were of high social standing could vote, poor white women couldn't vote because they were kept out by the poll tax. So from 1920 to 1950, a lot of different groups worked on different pieces of voting rights to, um, that would apply to their own communities. And a lot of women also were fighting fights against the poll tax. So women who worked at universities and professional women were organizing with women who had legal educations like Nina Milianico of Birmingham and Virginia Doerr who was an activist. It all eroded the idea that that only educated elite people should be able to vote. So more people, more people during this time were beginning to understand that more people needed to have the vote. And all of this tied into the social pressures that were already causing unrest and that led to the civil rights movement that really took off in the 1950s and 60s.